All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. I know uh, it's late in the day, and everyone just had a nice lunch, and we've got many things to do to get ready for classes starting next week. So we do appreciate you being here. First thing, uh, there is an evaluation form on your chair, or chairs around you, so be sure to fill those out. When you, at the end, you can put in that little box over there. So uh, my name is Mike Mastroda, and I uh, work in facilities management. I know most of you, but I don't know all of you, so it's nice to see some new faces here, too. Uh, and I manage our campus arboretum. And joining me today, Jesse Myler. I'm Jesse Myler, I'm an environmental Stephanie Sapnero, I'm the grounds um, operations manager at AU. Um, and unfortunately, thanks to our government shutdown, Cindy Brown, who's the Smithsonian Gardens, who's supposed to be here, but she's not committed to be here because she can't work today. So um, I'm going to start by just kind of giving you a really broad overview of the Arboretum. And so I want to start by saying that the Arboretum is a tool. It's here for everyone on campus to enjoy and to use, especially faculty. So we do a lot of work, especially with some of you that are already here, you know we have some connections and partnerships that are ongoing and hopefully growing. And But uh, if you haven't worked with us, we'd love to try to figure out ways that we can help you with your classes and things. Um, you know, an arboretum, by definition, is a professionally managed landscape that is, has a collection of plant material that's on display for public enjoyment, research, and education. The AU definition of an arboretum is a little different, a little broader, because we think of our arboretum is really everything that happens outside the building. So plants that we have are part of it, but it's also all the activities you see on campus, creating spaces for students, um, you know, traffic, cars, pedestrians, safety, um, lighting, all those different things that they go into the outside. And buildings certainly are part of the uh, art arboretum as well because the building facades what we see in form the spaces of the campus. So I always like to start presentation going way back. Uh, but does anyone know where this picture is taken from? It's back in like 1898, right when AU was getting started with that big board circle. It's pretty much standing in one circle, yeah. So you're looking out towards Maryland, and you can see Massachusetts Avenue was the two-lane dirt road. So Katzen would be on the right, Main Gips would be on the left. And I like to start with this because it shows that, you know, this 120 years, this plot of land has really changed a lot. And uh, the only building on the campus at the time was the, was the old Murdoch House, which is this farmhouse that's kind of set up near where the President's office building is now. So then, you know, start building things like first hall. You can see here is kind of the. Is that totally? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's it's a little bit better. so here's first one. It was just finished. Second. Might have been That's like a, a you know ceremony possibly. Um, but it wasn't only just about buildings. You know, the amphitheater we all know and love dates way back to the beginning of the university. That's first hall up there. You know that. Things have changed quite a bit in the amphitheater in the last 120 years. Uh, and when we talk about you know what's happened over the past 120 years, you've got to think about what's going to happen over the next 120 years because it would be as dramatic as these before and after pictures. Does anyone know where this picture's taken? This is easily stumps people. It's on the far face of the east. Is that the dorms? The yeah, so that's Patel on the left. Kogod would be over here. And that's looking down towards the amphitheater. So so our campus, our quad, used to be full of cars. And you could park right up on the quad. So you had to have these roadways to get up there. So today, you know, that same view is, is now no more cars. And really like Kim Perrin's comment about why she ended up at AU was the best parking lot. <laughs> that was so we funny this morning. We can park here anywhere. That was great. Um, and the quad, you know, this is back when the library just was brand new and just opened. You see like the clock tower wasn't even there yet. And, you know, now the quad is much more lively and much more uh, kind of an argument of campus. I love this one, Jay Spiritual Life Center, right? I think I always think the funniest about this is the way the doors were painted to look like plywood. 
I mean, at least we have places closed or condemned, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. So, you know, today we have some glass doors and a nice uh, landscape around it. So it really creates a different feel. This is another good one. Uh, talking about places to park. This used to be one of my favorite places to park when it wasn't being used as a construction staging area. This is right, lower gate, you come right in, you can park right there. Uh, very convenient. But when Kogod uh, was expanded, you are able to take out the parking lot and really create this great entrance into campus, which is just transformational. A lot of the um, things at the Arboretum have been transformational. In fact, back in 2010, Adrian Higgins, who's a garden writer for the Washington Post, came to campus and wrote a piece about how the landscape had transformed the campus. Um, going back to old times, though, this was Bishop Hurst, our founder, working with an architect. I'm not sure who the architect was, but they had sketched out what the science building could look like. Here we are 120 years later building a science building. But they also you know, had gone so far as to envision what the, the architecture might look like. And as you may have seen, you know, this is what our science building looks like. So it's a lot different than the old you know, gothical style of architecture. It's not only about buildings, it's about people too. So I found this image because I just built the, um, our new field hockey field. This is our 1930 girls field hockey team. You can see Hearst is up there. So I guess they were practicing up on the quad, I suspect. So I sent this to our coach, Steve Jennings, who loved it because he showed what he looks like now. And you know, there's some people that are even saying, that, you know, who knows what the next 20, 20 years are going to bring. But our, our American Eagle that is kind of, you know, known as campus mascot. And uh, some people are starting to think that we might have a new mascot coming up. Who knows? The blonde cat is getting really popular on campus. So the Arboretum is really about these four things. This is how it was kind of founded. One is recruitment. We thought that it could help recruit students. We thought that it would be a good community relations, uh, a good you know, thing for the neighbors to engage with the university. Also, we thought that it would be good for fundraising. And last, and certainly not least, this is not any order of importance, education. We thought that it's another way we could expand the educational opportunities here at AU. So starting with recruitment, we've all seen the campus tours going around campus. And it's really uh, easier to sell a campus when you have scenes like this that you're you're seeing as a prospective student. Um, I saw a study not too long ago that said students, when they're shopping around what school to go to, make their decision for, for whether to include the university or not include the university in 10 minutes. First 10 minutes on campus. And that's before they probably talk to anybody, maybe even set foot in the building. So what they see, and if they can see themselves relating, fitting in, that's what um, they base their decision on. You know, fall is really nice around campus as well. So we have lots and lots of pretty pictures. But back 1990 time frame before the Arboretum was even an idea, when the campus looked like this, we had about a little under 5,000 applications to attend a year. By 2016, that was almost 20,000. So you can see that um, obviously the Arboretum doesn't take credit for that huge jump totally, but certainly played a role in that. I mean, you know, we see the traditions around campus of um, the freshman class coming through the Arboretum on their way, meeting Claude the Eagle for the first time. And, um, but traditions, you know, there was a tradition previously of wearing the freshman beanie and uh, having on your back your name, your residence hall, and where you're from. Luckily, that has gone away. We don't do that anymore. Um, we have this new tradition that started just last year, the first uh, class picture, which I thought was, that was pretty cool. Um, so I think the Arboretum does help with recruitment of students, and that's why we wouldn't, none of us would be here if we didn't have students. Talking about community relations, you know, we're surrounded by a lot of uh, residential community, as well as you know everything that Washington, D.C. has to offer. So one of the things we started doing is, uh, and we've done first for students, but become more popular with our neighbors, is we do these full moon tours of the Arboretum. So we usually do like twice a year. Last time we did it, we had like 80 neighbors 
show up and they don't care if it's raining or the fun no matter what. So this wasn't that tour, but um, another one that we've done. And I, I really love to see when our neighbors come to campus and just to enjoy walking around, whether it's walking your dog, bring your kids. And the kids like use a labyrinth in some creative ways sometimes, do little tracks for running. Um, talk about fundraising, this and faculty, this is a little space out in front of Creator Hall, kind of tucked away, uh, really was kind of no man's land. And a, a fa former faculty member upon her retirement, uh, she worked in Creator in the economics department. So she wanted to do something to that space. So we created this little oasis garden that's there. And you, it's kind of a, it changes from year to time of the year, but it's really kind of a neat space. And often uh, it was a surprise for people who don't know about it. Our cherry tree grove up on Nebraska Avenue, you may have seen that. That was another um, gift to the university, it was a gift um, to the Arboretum from parents of a student who was here at AU. And they gave us the funds to actually transplant those trees. They were actually up at Nebraska Hall. When the addition was put on Nebraska Hall, they were going to cut these down. So we were able to use that funds to transplant them and create this really nice grove. And probably our, our biggest arboretum gift is uh, the Wyman property, which is adjacent to AU. And Mary Wyman, who unfortunately recently passed away, this is her garden, and she uh, really gave her three acres to the university because she wants AU to preserve her garden. We can tear her house down, but we can keep her garden. So uh, we're excited, you know, just got this property, we're in the process of getting, we're not sure how we're going to use it, but it's right across the street from us. Where is it? It is uh, right across um, Rockwood Parkway from the Fletcher Gate entrance. Um. So education, uh, <coughs> I think the Arboretum is really a neat place because it's conducive for you know, thought and, and study and, and just be out in nature makes you feel better, I think, uh, psychologically. And, you know, what a great place to study is going to be like that, right? And with Wi Fi, we, you know, can have small group meetings anywhere on the campus. Um, we often see, you know, this is up at the law school at Kenley. So, you know, creating these places, actually, the outdoors and um, working with groups or uh, sometimes large groups. I love to see classes go outside. Uh, I've talked to some faculty members who say, we can never hold a class outside because we don't have our power. So, I'm not so sure. That works too sometimes, right? Uh, we get a lot of tours to classes. I know we've toured some of your classes. And whether it's about the environmental aspects of campus or the arboretum or Sometimes for freshman uh, students who don't know what the names of the buildings are, kind of a neat way to give them a tour, get to know campus a little bit, find out about the arboretum, find out about some of the environmental pieces of campus. Nice introduction. And then, of course, you know, the campus is really kind of, especially the quad, is really the heartbeat of the community, I think, a lot of times. That um, this is our gathering space, it's a place we go to interact with one another. But from the education piece, sometimes you know, there's a lot of ways that um, the Arboretum interacts with the students in, in the art program. Sometimes the Arboretum comes into the classroom, in this case, and again with the art students. Um, sometimes we go into the classroom. This is a, a project, it's an environmental science project with uh, I raised some posters and student work. Some of the um, less obvious connections, we have a student, Caroline Salant, who graduated a couple years ago. She was a music major, and she wrote her senior capstone, uh, original piece of music theme on the Arboretum. We got to perform it for the AU Symphony Orchestra. That was fun. Of course, there's the historical aspects of campus, like the John F. Kennedy uh, Memorial down by the fields, and we often bring students down there. Uh, we have one faculty member, uh, Joe Campbell, who's a journalism uh, professor. And he actually has it does a, with us as a surprise visit. We like pop into his class unannounced and say, get up, get up your stuff, we're going down. A little thank you, we get down here. They already talked about the speech. 
most of the students have no idea that the speech is like it was slack. Um, also, you know, the historical partners, cultural pieces, this as the cherry trees lead through to our uh, our creative garden. So uh, as you know, our creative master lives right next door, and they participated in, in providing some things to AU as a gift. And uh, there's, so there's a cultural aspect as well to the Arboretum. And then some of the environmental things that go into some of the things Jesse works with, but the community garden is one. You know, about tennis courts, planting trees on campus, uh, and teaching students how to do that. And you know, one day those trees will grow to be uh, their kids to kind of gather around. So uh, we have rain gardens and fire retention bases, which are things that we can talk about uh, how we can manage stormwater on campus. Some of our green roofs, we have about 15 green roofs now. Some of our green roofs have solar panels on them, some top of very green, they're just building for right now. And then, this is actually the best room we could give this talk in because it's right outside the window here is our green roof with our beehives. So, um, talking about grant money and, and research and things like that, we have a beekeeping society, which is a student run club here on campus. So, we have some money um, received a grant from the DC Department of Energy and Environment to redo this green roof and to um, make it more bee friendly. So we're going to work with our beekeeping students to figure out where the best places for the beehives to go and redesign that roof um, here. Hopefully it'll be uh, ready to plant on campus beautification here this April night coming up pretty soon. Another side of the I just threw a slide in there. We have this barely uh, piece of land, 360 acres out in Fauquier County. I think the university is still trying to figure out what's the best way to use that. I know some uh, faculty are using it already, and uh, we'd like, we are really just doing what we'd like to get involved in either being out there or we're doing some projects out there. So it's like, you know, for environmental standards and growing food and things like that, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so the Arboretum is also the place that creates the memories. So you often see people taking pictures, especially for ceremonies like graduation. And I love this one because I think this proves that you know, sometimes the Arboretum does leave a mark on some of our students at least. Uh, I'm not sure who this was, but I wish that we've uh, like, heard the story behind that. Um, I want to talk quickly about partnerships. And we have several outside groups that we work with and on campus groups, like the Casey Tree Foundation is one. Um, our Center for Environmental Filmmaking here in School of Communications. And then um, the Smithsonian Gardens, unfortunately, Cindy's not here. Stephanie's going to talk a little bit more about our work with them. And I work with the Environmental Science Department here on campus. So, just real quick, you know, Casey Trees is a nonprofit foundation here in the city with the uh, charge to preserve and enhance the tree canopy of the city. So we've done things like hold workshops. Um, they've provided trees for our campus. Really, I've lost count now. It's been over 500 trees that they've given us over the last few years. Um, they come, they provide the trees, they plant them for, that, for us. Where we have students involved in the planting, which is great. In this case, it was right. This was actually on our campus. Um, another thing that they did, or they did with some of the research pieces of this, was a uh, student capstone project where they tried to all these little green dots are all of our 3,500 trees on our campus, and they measured each of those trees using something Casey Trees puts together, which is called iTree, which is a kind of a calculator that helps measure how much carbon is sequestered out of their project to figure out. Um, the carbon sequestration. Um, Center for Environmental Filmmaking, that's right here on campus, and uh, Maggie Stogner now uh, runs that. She could be with us today, but I wanted to share kind of the stories. Um, this is Elizabeth, who graduated last year. She was a grad student in environmental filmmaking. So Elizabeth's story is kind of interesting because it kind of those four areas we talked about with you know, recruitment, fundraising, community relations, 
and education all kind of came together with her project. So we had a group, uh, a local garden club, because one of their members was an AU alum, that was the connection, and they wanted to do something um, to give some money to AU to help fund something for the Arboretum. So we got together and said, we really would like to do a documentary film about our campus Arboretum. And um, we worked with uh, Chris Palmer at the time, and um, Elizabeth ended up getting that. So she received money to, to do this little film for us. So she actually did, ended up doing like four films for us uh, off that same amount of money. And I'm going to show you the real short version now. Because I don't want to show you the 12 minute version. Uh, this will work. <laughs> I'm Sylvia Burwell, president of American University, and I'm so glad that you joined us for this look at American University's Arboretum and Gardens. You can find a sense of belonging among the Arboretum and Gardens here at American University. Our campus is unique in so many ways, but one of my favorite is that our entire campus is designated as an arboretum. With more than 3,000 trees and one of the most diverse collections of plants found on any university's campus, you can both enjoy its beauty and learn so much in our natural setting. American University is a beautiful place to live and learn. Located in our nation's capital, our students can easily reach all the city has to offer and come home to a campus that is peaceful, inspirational, and supportive of all the lively, fun activities that you'll find at a world-class university. And with green roofs, bioretention basins, rain gardens, permeable paving, solar panels, a community garden, an apiary, and other sustainable features, our campus is a model of how to manage an urban landscape in a sustainable way. Our arboretum and gardens show us and teach us that we can all be responsible stewards of our environment. On behalf of myself, and our entire American University family. I invite you to come visit and see our beautiful arboretum and gardens for yourself. So we, uh, it's actually the first time we've shown that in public. So uh, we're not sure how we're gonna use it and we're hoping that you guys want to use it, it's available. Uh, but I'd like to see maybe admissions, you know, if they need to use this, or um, Sharon Alston or recruitment. You have it on the website. Really well done. Yeah, yeah she did a great job. Yeah. yeah, she worked on it for an entire year. So it was, uh, and that, again, that's just this, the, kind of the trailer of the bigger, longer film. I'm going to turn it over to Jesse to talk a little bit about how uh, we work with him on the environmental science. Um, so this isn't just my list. This is a compilation of different different projects that environmental science professors and students have been involved in on campus. That many of them are interdisciplinary. Most of them involved talking to Mike and Stephanie first before they even conceptualized them, right? Um, and they were projects that um, were pretty authentic to the students' interests but then also to the um, arboretums and to AU's needs, or interests also, whether they're needs, because mm -hmm. yeah, I think they're needs. But um, the Pollinator Partnership and then also the Audubon Cooperative Sanctuary Program were both uh, projects that came out of the Environmental Science Senior Capstone class, and um, both of which was when A.T. Hilton was teaching the class, he was working with Mike and with Stephanie, to see what sorts of projects could be done on campus that the students could actually undertake in actually implement during that semester or at least shortly thereafter. So um, 
The certification actually provides recognition for wildlife and habitat management, water conservation, and resource management on campus. Um, the pollination partnership also was the result of student projects from that class. And the two were both suggested through Mike and Stephanie and through the students. Most of the work was actually done by the students. Um, it involved taking an inventory of local flora. Um, in the um, case of the Audubon certification, involved putting in some birdhouses. I don't know how many. Do you know how many? Um, like six to eight, I would think. Yeah, so they had to install the birdhouses. Um, and then there was a lot of paperwork involved, too. Most of which I never would have gotten on top of that. Right, and so and the students really took it upon themselves to complete it as part of their project for the senior capstone for environmental science. Um, and then for some of the other classes, we have um, 100 and 200 level labs that we try to use the campus as much as possible. Um, and this, I, while I am an example from the environmental science department, this is not indicative of just science. I think that you can use the campus for so many different classes, um, experiential learning period, whatever it is, by getting people out into the, um, into the campus and seeing it as more than just the place they walk from class to class, but actually a learning space as well. Um, so I really enjoyed Mike's pictures, and as he was scrolling through them, trying to identify all of those places on campus and whether or not I've actually used them <laughs> with students. Um, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. Um, but it's interesting, also, you mentioned tours. Um, and that's something that I think that is, for first year students, a really interesting way to introduce them to campus. And in fact, this might be something that we can actually work with either AUX or with you guys, Complex Problems, something to try to get um, first year students out. I had so much feedback from my Complex Problems students and the AD Scholar students that that was one of their favorite things was the tours with Mike and Stephanie um, around campus and seeing it not just from a admissions type of perspective, but actually from an environmental perspective of their environment, not environmental like environmental science, but their actual, you know, organic environment around them. And so I, they really enjoyed that a lot. Um, so that's maybe something to consider for all classes, just because it's fun, it's interesting, first couple days of class getting the students out there. Um, so if you teach first year students, I think it's a real, it's a really um, a good goal. Um, so we have other, so I mentioned some of the labs um, in the past. We have, we've used the campus for counting squirrels, one of the least favorite activities. That's not going to be done anymore. But they, we've also used them for biocubes, which is a really cool um, space where the students take out a, 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 like a virtual cube and then they count the flora and fauna in that cube. Um, so it's more of a biodiversity index that they do around campus. And then um, we actually, that's part of a much larger project, citizen science project. And so that data is actually used as well. Um, and then uh, insect identification, which kind of tied in a little bit to the pollinator project, but there's, they actually use that in other, other classes as well. Um, and then we have a professor who actually, before she even came to AU, she was part of um, the Green Industry Professionals Day, and she walked around campus with her boss, identifying pollinators around campus. Um, that's something that actually I think um, she would like to do in the future too. So there's there's a lot of overlap and use of campus. Um, I don't know if you want me to talk a little bit about Air League too, um, because um, your second slide. Yeah, sure. Um, so I I has anyone been to Air League before? I think we'll be fine. Thank you. Though. <laughs> um, has anyone been to Air League? Okay, well, it's a really cool place. It's out in Warrington, Virginia. Um, like Mike said, AU acquired Airly, more inherited Airly, um, or was bequeathed Airly. Um, and so we have use of the grounds in, in certain respects. So it is still used as a conference center and kind of a um, hotel resort type place. Um, which is totally separate from AU, and it is a functioning um, business. And so for, in that respect, it is still generating funds that way, and so we can't actually impede any of those processes. However, we can, in many different disciplines, overlap with them. 
So in the food production, they actually have a working farm. It is an um, industrial scale farm, very small industrial scale, but still producing food for the conference center and the resort there, as well as for campus. And so a lot of the foods that are produced there at Airly are actually brought to campus. And so creating that tie between the local food production and what the students are eating in downstairs in the TDR is a really interesting component. And when I've taken students, especially first year students that use TDR, um, they're like, what? These potatoes that I'm eating came from Airly? I just got to pull them out of the ground or I got to like, and they gave them some to take home with them. <laughs> it's just this like, I don't know, maybe they've never been to a farm before. but. Um, but anyway, it was a really interesting thing. They also have a separate um, uh, organic garden. And they don't call that a farm because it's a much smaller scale. Right now, that garden, it has been used for food production in the past. Right now, it's being focused on herbs and flowers. It is still no spray as far as pesticides and fertilizers go, um, only organic methods. But they also have a greenhouse on the organic side as well. So there is some um, off-season production of food there. Um, they will do tours anytime it's beautiful to visit any time of the year one of the other draws to airly is that it was the place where earth day was conceptualized which is a really interesting tie for au and i hope that we are actually going to capitalize on that because this year is our 50th anniversary yeah why is so, in the works but i don't yeah, know if it's, um, it's hard to keep about it but um so that's anyway, Airly is something that you can arrange if anyone's interested in getting out to Airly, send me an email and I'll put you in touch with Larry Engel. Um, I don't know if he goes to organizing it or not, but care, um, Larry Engel in um, School of Communication and um, Kiho Kim were both the kind of co-liaisons for Airly. Um, I'm not sure if Kiho's still wearing that hat, hat or not, do you know? Um, but Larry is, and there's just a really simple form you fill out, and they, um, they'll they try to accommodate classes, groups, um, weekends, or during the week as much as possible. Is there transportation? There is transportation provided by, um, the, um, by the Office of Finance here. So they want to get people out there and to increase awareness. Students love it. They're like, baby owns this? It's so neat. And it is a beautiful place. There's ponds, there's big open areas to run around. They love to just feel free out in the middle of nowhere. It's a very pretty place. It takes about an hour to get out there. So you, if you have a block class, you really do have to budget for that accordingly if you're going to do it during class time. I've mostly taken um, students out on Saturdays um, and make it optional with a strong encouragement to come. And they almost all come because they want to do something fun on the weekend, so especially first year. I'm oh, sorry, if for a weekend, if you wanted to do a meeting, like we were just talking, there are special ways that we can make the students stay there. So, yeah, so um, I, yes, there is. Um, and I can put you in touch with the person that actually would help to arrange that. Right now, they're trying to develop an area of the grounds that are not used as heavily by the conference attendees to actually have somewhere to actually stay overnight. But that is not solidified yet and it is not free yet <laughs> whether or not it ever will be but there will be some sort of subsidized um, stay yeah yeah it's a it's a very pretty place and so that's the hope is that I think school of communication I'm sorry school of education is going to try to do some teacher training out there and so different departments trying to use our what is it it's like our, the arboretum annex is yeah. an airplane airplane community I know, it was an interesting side note about that. If you've ever seen the movie Fly Away Home, it's filmed part of this film there. Oh, yeah. really yeah. kind of I forgot that, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so then some of the um, some of the things that we're thinking about doing in the future, um, I will let Stephanie talk about this last one in a minute, but um, <clears throat> there's some pollinator projects that we're hoping to work with Mike and Stephanie on. Um, specifically, I teach a lot of first year classes or graduate classes, you know, a lot in between, it's funny. But um, the, the first year classes that I do for AU Scholars and then the Future Honors and also Complex Problems, I really try to do a project with the students. And the project in the past has involved something on campus. So in the, um, what I've done in the past is like the very the student-driven student project topics. Um, I teach a class on pollution solutions and the students would come up with something, a local pollution project that they wanted to research and, um, and then try to actually affect some sort of change during the semester. Um, 
That being said, in the future, we are going to work closely with Mike and Stephanie and with the Office of Sustainability to try to come up with projects that are driven by AU, um, and then maybe have kind of a list of, of projects that they could that they could choose from, kind of like the um, capstone projects that I referred to before, um, but something that's a little bit more um, doable. And so, um, so that's one part of it. I also teach um, a class in sustainable farming, well, two classes now. One is for AU scholars, a research class in sustainable farming, and then um, there's a graduate class that I'm co-teaching with someone from the uh, School of Communication. And we are planning on um, working on campus as well, and perhaps actually doing a little bit of um, like learning some techniques and some strategies for gardening, just in general, so that the students can actually use them in their research projects. So just some um, just some ways to kind of tie into and tap into the resources that we have, because we have two amazing experts here, and many more that work for you guys as well. And so um, sometimes we actually end up working with other grounds crew as well, which is awesome. And our grounds crew love. Yeah, it's really, really great. And I did just want to say that I put a picture of the amphitheater up there because you will find me in the amphitheater with classes more often than not. I try to take my classes out to teach outside as much as I possibly can. And sometimes that's not doable or you only have a short period of time and you can just use whatever is right outside the building where you are. I ended up on the sports, um, on the, the bleachers on the far side of the, um, the field sometimes. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie, and Stephanie's going to talk a little bit about the Learning by Meeting um, program. It's all right. Um, so uh, this is from some Smithsonian Gardens, uh, Cindy Brown, who um, is the, um, the um, in charge of education for Smithsonian Gardens. I um, can't be with us today because of the furlough. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about uh, Smithsonian Gardens and also a collaboration that we're doing with them. Um, so just a little Would background. Give a little background. Yes. So um, these are some photos of the Smithsonian Gardens. Um, each um, each building at the Smithsonian has a garden around it and is assigned a groundskeeper. And they try to keep um, kind of the theme of the planting um, in line with um, the in the museum that it, it represents, like the. Um, uh, Museum of the Native American um, has um, all like native plants around it. Um, yeah. Um, so they've got a lot of uh, um, Victorian style display gardens, um, very different than what we have at AU. Um, let's go to that. So another, yeah, different, yeah. Different, yeah. Different seasons, different planting. Um, they also have um, pollinator gardens, and um, uh, and they have some interpretive signage and things like that that we have at AU as well. Um, they um, have educational programs. This is one thing that Cindy works on, um, and this is um, Community of Gardens. Um, you can look it up on their website. Is that right, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, they've actually just reached out to different gardens across the city to kind of tell their story about gardens at their schools or in the parks and things like that. So across the U.S. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a collection of, of garden stories. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about this, but um, I'll give you a little bit of background. So um, the American Public Garden Associate, Gardens Association is um, kind of the umbrella professional organization for our Raymond and Botanic Gardens across the country. Um, so I've gone to their annual conferences for the last 15 years, with I think one exception. Um, and I've learned a lot from people that I've met at um, this conference, um, particularly uh, from a program that um, UC Davis uh, in California started. Um, called the Learning by Meeting program, and they've been doing it for a number of years now, and um, several other gardens have started it, um, and um, Cindy uh, and I have decided that we want to collaborate on this. So basically, the idea behind um, the Learning by Leading program is to um, get student interns um, exposed to the public garden uh, field, and because there's really a shortage of of people that are going into um, 
into public gardens, and it's hard to find people um, who won't know, even know that that's a field or an opportunity to go into. So by the League, my learning program, it, it's an opportunity that you can give students for internships where they can learn about options in public gardens that may not be limited to just students that are majoring in environmental science or in horticulture, uh, but public gardens can be for all sorts of disciplines, communication, uh, development, um, education, many, just many different fields. So um, we thought that uh, the collaboration between us and the Smithsonian would be an ideal fit. So we have students in all sorts of disciplines and um, access to um, faculty and, and students who may want to participate in this. And the idea is that um, we give the students um, some guidance in the um, internship program, but we would allow them freedom to kind of figure out how to run whatever their particular um, areas that they're interested in and give them a little bit more ownership than you normally know, would give an intern. Um, and the idea is, is by giving them that extra responsibility of leading that they're actually learning um, how to manage people, how to manage projects, that sort of thing. Um, and it's something that I think is very valuable for them to be able to put on their resume when they're going out to mm -hmm. look for a job. Um, yes, yeah, so this, this is just the American Public Gardens Association um, that I mentioned, and um, actually um, they, they have a national conference every year, which I have talked about, and this year um, we're lucky enough to be having it in DC. So I'm on the planning committee for this conference. It's going to be here on the week of June 17th, and actually we're hosting the session for College and University Gardens on Monday the 17th. Um, so yeah, that the all day workshop that we're having, we'll, so we'll be having uh, people here from all over the country and, and Canada and some other countries that work for University Gardens and we'll be talking a lot about um, how to continue growing the learning by leading program, but also just uh, it's an opportunity to find out what other gardens are doing um, and how they're uh, working with their faculty and their students and, and various programs across all different disciplines. Okay. Else I, left out? <laughs> I would say maybe a little bit about learning by leading, just um, in that it's while it is a, it's a student focused program, um, but the hope is that we connect to and draw from lots of different, not just departments, but um, faculty and staff, and um, in building the program, and so mm -hmm. not just focused on like Stephanie said the guards themselves, but all of the different adjacent areas as well. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. So uh, UC Davis started their program in 2007, I believe. That must lie, I think they're up to 70 interns a year. And so it's really grown. So I think the potential here, and what makes us unique is that we're partnering with Smithsonian, which is, like opens up so many doors for faculty, staff, students, uh, you know, and just kind of limitless, all different things that Smithsonian does. So, um, you know, like start at the Smithsonian Garden level, it could really grow to be quite, you know, quite Yeah, large. it expose the students to all, all the different um, disciplines that the museums have to offer and the research and uh, networking opportunities and that sort of thing. So, um, I guess, you know, we got the end of our presentation, but I wanted to kind of open the floor up to, um, to chat more about it. If you have any ideas, if there's ways we can help you. Um, you have some takeaways and kind of great brochure. Can we maybe get a sense of how people in the in the audience have used the offer yeah. before? Or if, or if you have, or if you have <laughs> yeah. some ideas, how? Well, or if yeah. you haven't, but you're, you're interested in doing that. I can start. Yeah. So, um, Stephanie and Mark have <laughs> been given to us in my classes. One way that I use it every year is that I teach a course on uh, sustainable design and leadership and energy and environmental design, which is U.S. Great Building Council um, rating systems to grad students in SIS. And so we use, I use the Arbor Lee rating as, their, as a teaching tool for them on sustainable landscape design because we have to talk about everything from soil to water runoff to, you know, this question of pollution, 
um, in the context of what that means to um, essentially the built environment and development. So that's how I use it, among many other ways. Yeah, and I think what working with your classes and, and all the classes really, I mean, the feedback that we get from the students, um, and we, we learn as much or more than they do about um, you know, the way that they're thinking about the environment and you know, other ways that we can really reach out and connect with the students. So it's, it's really good for us to, to see things from the students' perspective and to have that direct contact with them. You know, how do you, I mean, being able, to, <laughs> being able to actually let them understand what biodiversity is from a haptic, kind of hands-on point of view is really priceless. So thank you. <laughs> Um, I teach, um, this is actually my first semester, but I'm going to be teaching um, biology classes, biology 210, so it's the uh, organismal diversity. And so I was trying to get an idea of what you guys, I've never been to the presentation before, so I didn't really have concept. But I teach, I've taught the lab before. And I don't know if you've heard about what the lab does, but the lab does do, um, you know, throughout the whole semester, they do contacts of certain, you know, your rain garden and your, you know, at different locales around the mm -hmm. campus, and they try to figure out, you know, what kind of diversity they're right. in terms of those different markets. So I was trying to think of ways that I can incorporate some aspect that's a little bit different from the lab into the lecture. So I was just getting a, kind of a broad sense of what you guys have. Yeah, we Do you guys have a natural, um, I guess, you know, relative to what's natural in more of this weekly area, but you know, what would be the closest area that um, AU would have as a resource that could represent, um, you know, like natural ecological um, you mean like an unmanaged? Yeah, like an unmanaged area. Or, yeah. You know, representatives of this area or Part of Rock Creek Park probably Rock would be the closest. Right. Well, there's actually, But also right. Yeah, right there. across the street is, is a, a, the a finger of Battery the Battery Kemble. Kemble Park. Mm -hmm. Battery Kemble is managed by Rock Creek Park, but it's not part of the Rock Creek tributary system. It's okay. just, but it's, you walk there. Do you know where it is? No, I don't know. Oh, you, you can walk your students there. So we yeah. take them there also. It's right um, if you walk down Nebraska, it's on the corner of Fox Hall, Nebraska. We've, uh, when Fox Hall turns into, when Nebraska turns into a lot of Yeah, it's, I mean, it's one Fox walk Hall. down on the opposite side of Nebraska. Right, right. Yeah. But as far as actually on campus spaces, I would say the amphitheater probably has its more like naturalistic. Okay. Yeah, closest to natural. Um, but yeah, you're right. Nothing's really natural. Yeah, we've And I've had um, actually uh, interesting with um, classes. I don't know if it was the class you're teaching, or I'm not sure if it was in environmental science, but I actually heard um, some of the classes that have done like sampling of biodiversity yes. in like the amphitheater area yeah. versus Battery Kemble Park. They've actually found more diversity on campus because there's so many invasive species in Battery Kemble Park. So I don't and know. Dogs. And dogs. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, we've toured that class several times, and um, what we do find is, you know, we can find places, and like Stephanie says, where we can compare and contrast. Yeah. So something's more developed and less developed, both on campus and compared to some of the other more wild places. Yeah. So in the labs, you know, like each different um, uh, lab partners you know, compare the different areas, kind of try to bring them together so we can compare each other's that they're focused, and we do it that way. Right. So maybe that's what you're thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, so I teach uh, Introduction to Geographic Information Systems, and uh, over the past several years I've done three student projects on campus. Uh, we first did a uh, inventory of the locations for bike racks, so we spatially mapped them as well as captured their attributes. Uh, we then did the uh, planters, the cement planters that are movable. And then we did the standpipes, uh, where there was water access on campus. And I'm still, I need more, uh, because the projects are the kinds of hands-on, use your cell phone and capture some data that I hope the students will get comfortable with doing um, in any uh, opportunity. And, and so I need, I need another project. We've got plenty. All sure. right, let's take you from that course. <laughs> Let me know. Yeah, that's another thing. We really love to take advantage of the brilliant students that we have here. Um, and they've got so many skills that we don't have. Um, and um, I know Kino was wonderful with using um, his capstone class for a couple of years and um, it enabled me to get um, some projects done with Don Juan. Uh, 
community certification and pollinator uh, partnership that I just don't have time to do. Um, so it's and it's a real project. You know, they and they keep their name on it, and they can say they did it, and it really helps you know the whole university. So it's a great partnership. Um, I'm Jerry Fresh. I'm an adjunct in the sociology department, and I met everybody by last semester. And I was teaching uh, City in Place, which was an urban sociology class. And I'm coming in from a background of having worked in the UN system and dealing with um, everything from climate change, adaptation, and its impact on health, to my own personal interest, which is that interface. I study interaction between not only individuals, but structures of interaction between people and place, the environment, so the, the role of the built environment in how it affects social interaction patterns. You know, if, if the sidewalk narrows, and people bump into each other, and how do we really engage in health? So my interest in this, and I will think back later, not in, um, is to actually, I'll be teaching public sociology and a course on health and human rights. But the public sociology is very much designed to bring the field of sociology as a discipline into much more use of GIS and use of information about the planet on which interaction occurs. So I'm very interested in making sure that students recognize the need for the study of Specific, uh, specific place down to its geographic properties and levels. That sort of big idea, my focus has been on the food system. So I'm listening to you about the farm and I'm thinking, okay, we can map the food system, those steps between growing, the, you know, what I call from, from farm to fork, but from pot to the plate. So if you have a farm here, what are those systemic steps from growing it, to transporting it, to bringing it here, to serving it, to using the leftovers as compost, all of that kind of thing. So I'm very interested in these social interaction processes. And I, can I actually ask you a question? Too? Yeah. Um, because I, I um, just a little history. I'm, I'm coming in from an academic way back working up in, at UMass Amherst, which had a very early permaculture kind of engaging and edible Landscape. So I'm wondering if on campus, is there a permaculture or agroecology certificate or any kind of program for students? Would that be something? I mean, it seems like an ideal place in the summer. There is isn't currently that I'm aware of. Um, we've had a couple of students like an SIS student a few years ago who was interested in that. Uh, and he, I think, did what did he do? Like a study? He built a little um, permaculture down in our community garden for a semester. Because so, I would like to really share with you stuff that I've been working on, and I think would really be fun to it begins to have A and B become a sort of a model down in the middle. You know, you've got you know, which there are studies that are interested. Yeah, there's definitely a lot I've had students that have done permaculture um, you can see studies, these, but abroad. Yeah, yeah exactly. It seems to be I saw in this area that some of you do have the A Airy is called Airy. 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 It seems like I mean I'm just thinking that I already know instructors who love to come down and do a series of weekends and use the space out there and really begin to re you know examine what are these different models of, of land use and kind of things like that. So I'd be very interested in talking okay, about that. Very yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm Jessica Marcy. I'm an MFA student in the School of Communication and Film. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean I just appreciate the environment on campus just as a student. Um, so I just came out of interest in learning, you know, desire to learn something new. Actually, and, and I did have a question. What was that course that you mentioned um, on farming with SSC? And it's called Environmental Science and Filmmaking, but our focus is on sustainable um, farms. Um, and it's offered, it's a 400, 600 level class this semester. And it's, we're offering it both as SSC and um, EMBS credit. And who's the applicant? Larry Abel. This semester? Yeah. What's the time that you are? It's a block class on Wednesday mornings. Okay. We've been approached this semester by a, a student, his undergrad, who wants to do some type of film related to our reading for a, this one semester project. So we're going to work with him. That's great. Yeah, yeah. We've, been, we've had a lot of interaction with the School of Communication, um, just with the environmental filmmaking and um, 
uh, ceremony commission um, for visual literacy class. We've done quite a bit with, with that. So um, there's so many options we're willing to, to engage in any ideas that are feasible. Yeah, this semester we're going to. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, but so this semester we are going to be working with Sarah McKee Fish um, yeah. to uh, kind of lay the market for learning by leading program with her yeah. visual literacy class. So that's already set up. That's good. She uses Sarah with that too. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Rebecca. I'm a staff member actually. So I work on the Complex Problems Program, which is for mostly first year students. And we also have student staff members that work in the classes. So. I'm kind of coming at this from a lot of different angles, but obviously I'd love to see more complex problem pieces space on campus. I think the environmental classes do it kind of naturally, the kind of urban spaces classes do it naturally, but I want to see it a little more in the other subjects as well. Um, Maybe and then, more the, the program leaders then. Yeah, so I'm thinking doing something for the program leaders would be really great, like some kind of even just a one day like day of service where they get together and work in the garden or something like that. I think that would be really awesome like, space for them to engage. And then also like for me as just a staff member, I really want all of our offices to be considerate of the environment as we're working through our day-to-day -day work. Um, so I'd love to see the program leaders thinking of that as well as this is one of their first like jobs that they're having, right? You know, and that taking that idea and using it for this work. So I definitely work with, you know, faculty and staff and we've toured many different departments. I mean, one department, uh, several departments have like, um, uh, like retreats, even just on campus retreat day. Um, and one of the most interesting ones, I think that we toured uh, of IT, a group of IT uh, staff. And I guess my expectations from from them. I just thought they were into the inside of technology, but they were just amazed um, when the, we toured them, right? Do you remember that, Mike? And, um, you know, we were like, wait, the computers was here. And they were just, you know, so interested and so engaged. So we, you know, love um, touring different departments, meeting other staff members. I think, you know, it's, it's good to share ideas like we're doing right here in this room with. You know, one department's interested, and this another department's interested in the same thing. So more collaboration can occur. So I think that that's good. So we we toured HR before, um, just many different like different um, groups, library staff. Yeah. It's interesting. It that <laughs> a lot of faculty and a lot of staff, and I think a lot of grad students too. Also, they come to AU's campus, they go to their building, they do their work, they go back to their car, and they, they leave, and they never see the campus oftentimes um, and even some of the undergrad students I, I challenged them like the one in particular a senior said that she had been on this my tour before and she knew everything about them she wasn't gonna learn anything she was in this <laughs> so that challenged me it's like you're gonna learn something new. and uh sure enough within like five minutes it took you a place she'd never been before it's like this 84 acre campus in four years you've never been here you sure you know so you know it was my class. It was your class. They yeah. loved it. Yeah. They loved it. They didn't talk much, but later yeah. they said this is the best thing. I've been on campus for four years and never knew this yet, right. but they loved it. Right. And I do it all the time. Well, I think the students just like getting outside. Yeah. Like, yeah. Getting nice them to move is a huge issue. Right. Yeah. And seeing the campus in a new way that they you know, would see. Yeah, we almost always tour um, a stress management class and, um, with Amy Rowe. Um, and, um, talk about how just get you know when you're having a bad day and you're feeling stressed, how just spending a few minutes outside or you know, just sitting listening to birds or watching a squirrel or just enjoying you know the being outside can really reduce your stress level a lot. Absolutely, and that reminded me. Um, this fall we started doing some hiking expeditions with UC, so we offered free urban hikes that were actually taught by Jen Johnson, who's the Director of Orientation at AU, but she also teaches a like one credit urban hiking class on campus. So that might be something to think about partnering with her yeah. because she has she comes from an exercise science background and not the environmental background, but mm -hmm. to have both there would be really great. Sure. That's a good idea. That's a great idea, yeah. Is there a place where we can as because I'm new, this is my second semester, I'm really interested in a lot of those things. Is there a central location? Where we can maybe all meet into it so that we know where we can know what's going on on campus 
I mean, it seems like it would be great if we could have a, maybe a website or something which is related. It's to probably the somewhere on the website, but it's not very easy yeah. to find. Well, you, you post your uh, tours, right? When you oh. when you have a scheduled tour, don't you? Do we do it by um, yeah. with, like there's existing list serves out there? So we contact the person you know, who um, mans the list serve and we put it on that one. But yeah, we need to create our own list serve. So there's a new top store right <laughs> Yeah, there's yeah. an internship yeah. inter inter opportunity, right? Yeah. Go yeah. Co co coordinate. That's great. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Reading by Larry, that'd be okay. Definitely. Yeah. Ashley. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Blue. Uh, I'm a second year grad student in the Center for Environmental Sciences program. Okay. So, um, what interested me in this session was that like, I don't get to experience much of the campus just because as graduate students or anything like focus is like our studies and whatnot. So we don't really get to explore much of the environment around us. So I remember last semester I probably took like I had time and just explore the campus and what it had to offer and just really amazed at like just the structures and how you know it um, are inclusive of the environments in it. Um, one interest for me is um, how, I don't really see that word as siloed, but how um, students, particularly the Center for Environmental Filmmaking, can somewhat um, work with uh, your offices, uh, whether it be like producing media content or anything in that, um, that field. That would be something that I think a lot of graduate students, especially within my field, would be interested in the like class collaboration. Um, I know there's a class offered, but sometimes it doesn't work with our schedules or requirements that we have to fulfill for graduation. But I would just be interested in to see like how we can build um, more more uh, partnerships in a sense uh, with graduate students interested in this. Um, because before this session, like I really wasn't, I didn't know much information about it. Um, but I think that this is like a great opportunity. Just all the information that I'm receiving is really amazing. Yeah. 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 yeah, thanks for coming. And we definitely want to do that too. So, I mean, we, I especially get wrapped up in the day to day operations, so like managing our grounds and snow removal this weekend and things like that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, sometimes it's hard to, you know, get organized and get things like that in place. but. Uh, that's definitely where I can use help from students and, and faculty, and we definitely want to do it. Yeah. We I'm, do have um, you know, internships okay. oftentimes. So if you're just something curious that you think we make a connection, we'd love to talk to you. Okay. We got some interesting public. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions for us? Okay. I think we'll end early. Yeah, yeah. thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. Me. And there is a dessert. Thing uh, at four. Yeah, <laughs> sure. The rat bowl. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys are the right people to talk to about this, but like the whole AU is carbon neutral claim yes. and that kind of thing. I'm wondering if you have any insight on kind of how true that is. Or even today, like they said, this is a zero waste event. Yeah. Um, you know, what what do you think what is happening mean? with that? So. Uh, the carbon neutrality thing, you know, we are the first university in the, in the United States to be uh, carbon neutral. And uh, so, you know, that was done with like reducing our energy use as well as uh, you know, through recycling and just mm -hmm. reduction. Uh, but we do have offsets that we purchase as well. That's how we, have, we make up the difference. Yeah, our offset huge, sustainability. Huge, yeah, huge offsets with the. We have a um, partnership with a solar farm in North Carolina, and that produces a lot of the energy that um, is on our energy grid. So a lot of the offsets are made that way. I'm sorry, I can't explain it better than that. Yeah. But um, that's we're a little over fifty percent of our energy is produced either at the solar farm or to reduction projects, and the other forty-five percent or so is is made up through offsets. And uh, there's lots of different offset programs that we're involved with. And they try to keep the offsets as um, relevant and um, relevant to either local um, AU issues or relevant to specific departments and programs in AU. So one of them is um, 
there's something that's being done in uh, in partnership with the AU program in Nairobi. There's another one that's being that's going on in Costa Rica with our with our program there. And so there is there's meaning and thought behind where the offset programs are being um, used. Where, however, it is not necessarily just that we are not using that carbon, and a lot of the um, the carbon use really does come from travel. So whether that's travel abroad or students um, traveling to and from home or us getting to and from campus, um, that's all factored in, um, especially the travel abroad, because that's not something that we want to discourage students from doing, but we have to find ways to kind of compensate for that. And so I, I sound like I'm from the Office of Sustainability. I'm not at all. But I was looking for but I heard the spiel, so we all should be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, but Megan and Hannah are really, um, they're really awesome also for tours and for um, information. They'll come and they'll give talks to your classes also. Um, and so you can reach out to them as well if that's something that yeah. maybe for the program leaders that would be something you could work with. Megan or Hannah could kind of push into one of your groups or they can do a combo tour with Mike and Stephanie. With them, yeah. um, and then they can share that kind of information so that then they can answer questions for your first year students. Right, I think that's... Because they're they're being told these things, but without necessarily the context, they get a little bit of it in AUX, um, but not as much as maybe yeah. we would like it. What you retain from the, um, what am I not remember, Eagle Summit? What was the, yeah. yeah, what they retain from that is it's gone, so. And the other thing, we have a zero waste manager um, mm -hmm. who actually works in the same office as Mike, um, and um, he partners a lot with the Office of Sustainability. So he's actually responsible for you know, all the containers on campus. We do all, we just started doing all of our own hauling with all of our trash and recyclables and that sort of thing. So, I mean, he knows exactly what's going on and you know, he's happy to come and talk to classes or um, departments as well and explain kind of where we are and the challenges that we have. Um, if, you know, with the zero waste event today, um, I'm sure, uh, well, I'm not sure, but I know, I always glance down at the, the trash cans or the recycling cans or whatever you want to call them that, and see what people are doing and if they're following the directions of putting things in the right cans and then they, they never are. No. <laughs> no, absolutely not. So if, if it gets broken there, like it just doesn't complete and get to where it's supposed to get. So there's he's been trying to you know, figure out a, more education with that, um, but it's really That's a challenge. Really, it's, really, a, yeah. it's a huge issue. It's hard. I know last year they had to take the compost in out of the Redstone Halls because they were too contaminated. Right. right. Yeah. So they're doing a new system yeah. this year, mm -hmm. which is, is working well. What's that? Is there composting on campus? Yes. Everywhere except for the residents. Well, we don't do our own composting okay, no. on campus. Yeah. Uh, very minimal. There's a little bit in the community garden. We just don't have enough space. Yeah. Right. Uh, is one problem, and or the you know, technology. or the technology to properly do it. And um, we are also in um, like what the fourth highest pest growth city in the country, country, which so. is also an uh, issue that I have to deal with every day. Mm -hmm. So that's another. The yeah. Wong cat can only be Wong so cat. Much. <laughs> so much. Yes, need a whole army of Wong cats. <laughs> so what we did for the composting this year was really interesting. So before, yeah, every restaurant hall had compost bins all over the place. And they were so contaminated that basically we got kicked out of the composting facility for some years. So, so um, the new program is if, if you're interested in composting your in your residence hall, we, we provide a little bin that's more personalized. You can compost there, and then there's a, each floor has a place where you Not each can, floor, just the first floor of each first floor, yeah. all, And it's not in an easily accessible area so that people don't dump trash in it that is not compostable. So it's usually behind behind the vending machines or something, so it's out of the way. People actually have to go make a oh, concerted sure. effort, conscious <laughs> effort, to actually go and dump their compost bin in it so you don't end up with a whole bunch of other stuff. And the other neat composting program is student-run, student-led, really. Um, we have a group of students that are very engaged. They're going around all the different vendors on campus. So they're going to the we've got Starbucks on board, which we could never do from a staff standpoint. When students go to Starbucks and say, hey, we really think you should be composting your grounds, and we're going to help you. We're going to bring a bin for you every day. We're going to collect it for you. So now they're on board. So. And that's all for the behind-the-counter um, food waste that's created. Right. Um, 
they're doing it. I think it almost all of them now. They have a yeah. little truck that yeah. they drive around, yeah, and, they're like, cool. and they get paid. It's a paid um, yeah. position. That was yeah. your way to get. Yeah. Have we been successful in getting all the packaging on campus as recyclable? No. Not 100%. Yeah. See, if, if, if the inputs are better managed, it's a lot easier for us to manage the outputs. So it's not, right. so a lot of it has to do with food packaging, but not all of it. And the, the part of the problem is that there are different, all of the different offices and departments manage this differently, right? So they all do their individual ordering. Um, and so I think that the, it would have to be a university-wide effort to actually get to that. But each of us could get our departments to reach out to sustainability and have them come in and help us learn what we should be doing. There is a green office program. What's it called? Green office program. Green office program. Green office program. Green office program. And it's a certification program that um, you have, it's kind of like a checklist. You have to go through, jump through a bunch of hoops, and then you get certified. And so each administrator. Like our green apple program? It's very similar. Cool. It okay. is. Um, and you, you get certified. And so it's a green office program on campus um, that they run. Yeah. Yeah, so that would work for those depart the department offices. For the and certifying them as green. A few years ago we had students do a waste audit and we used SIS as our example building. Basically you collect all the waste from one day worth of, of use and you go through it and you figure out what, what can be recycled, what can be composted, you know, what has to go to a landfill. And we really it was pretty amazing. We came out, it's like only about less than I think fifteen percent couldn't be recycled or composted or reused somebody. So it was really the, you know, potato chip bags, the, the candy wrappers were the big culprits. And then back then when we started, this was the styrofoam. So there's really no more styrofoam no longer. I don't think on campus, but. Uh, well, for packaging there is, but not, yeah, for, not for, for food packaging. Right, that's yeah. true, yeah. Mm -hmm. This would be an interesting, I, I did have um, a workshop that came from UMass where they were really, we analyzed the garbage. So they yeah. collected the garbage and we mapped it during from um, the dates and the time. It was really interesting because we could also see consumer use patterns, which was a really important link to what is the waste that's being produced. So we, we deconstructed basically that and trying to change. And that could be something if there's something interesting we could do. Yeah, both the, of, both the Office of Sustainability and Zero Waste, the blue do use of little zero waste audit they yeah. have, where they collect trash from a certain period, a certain area. And they have students with you know gloves and exactly. suits on <laughs> going right. through and sorting it all yeah. out. And you know, that's where we've learned that the majority of what goes into our trash is actually compostable. Yeah. But unfortunately we haven't figured out a way to get really clean compostable materials. That's the contamination as well. Yeah. Yeah. Challenge. So I think that we're kind of yeah. now, but if anyone has further questions, you can come on up and just